Joint Mobilizations Unfortunately, the content within this lecture is not located within the Therapeutic Modalities text by Chad Starkey or within the Therapeutic Modalities, the Art and Science text by Kenneth Knight and David Draper. Therefore, all content within this lecture will encompass the context on future examinations regarding joint mobilization. So let's start with the basics. What exactly are joint mobilizations? Joint mobilizations, also known as joint mobs, are a manual therapy technique utilized to manage and modulate pain, increase range of motion, and to treat joint dysfunctions that limit range of motion by specifically addressing altered joint mechanics. Some factors that may alter joint mechanics include pain and muscle guarding, joint hypomobility, joint effusion, contractures or adhesions in the joint capsules or supporting ligaments, and malalignment or subluxation of bony surfaces. To help us understand joint mobilizations, it can be helpful to better understand the terminology that is associated with it. A mobilization is a passive joint movement that is used to increase range of motion or decrease pain. These movements are applied to the joints and related soft tissues at varying speeds and amplitudes using physiological or accessory motions. The force is light enough that the patient can stop the movement if they so desire. The patient should be relaxed during the treatment. However, if the movement becomes too much, the patient could stop the movement if they needed to. A manipulation is a passive joint movement used to increase joint mobility. These movements incorporate a sudden forceful thrust that is beyond the patient's control. Manipulations are frequently used in chiropractic medicine to increase joint mobility. Physiological movements are movements done voluntarily. These are commonly called osteokinematics and occur as a result of the movement of the bones. Large movements are measurable. We can quantify the amount of movement available at the joints in the body with a goniometer. A goniometer allows a clinician to measure body mechanics in degrees. Osteokinematics are the result of concentric and or eccentric active muscle contractions. Movements can be measured such as flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, internal rotation, external rotation, pronation, supination, inversion, and eversion. Accessory movements are movements within the joint and surrounding tissue that are necessary for normal range of motion, but cannot be voluntarily performed. Accessory motions are generally associated with the physiological movement and are motions of the articular surfaces relative to one another. These movements are necessary for full range of physiological motion to occur and commonly the ligament and joint capsule are involved in the motion. Arthrokinematics are also known as accessory motions. Accessory motions are very small movements that help with the quality of the movement. Accessory movements may be difficult to measure because they are so small. Arthrokinematics can be altered by different mechanisms such as capsule tightness, ligamentous tightness, fascial tightness, muscle spasms, as well as other mechanisms. Component motions are motions that accompany active motion, but are not under voluntary control. An example of a component motion is the upward rotation of the scapula and rotation of the clavicle that occur with shoulder flexion. Joint play are motions that occur within the joint. Joint play is determined by a joint capsule's laxity. Joint play can be demonstrated passively, but the individual cannot perform the movements actively. Arthrokinematics are the motions of bone surfaces within the joint. There are five motions available, roll, slide, spin, compression, and distraction. Muscle energy uses an active contraction of deep muscles that attach near a joint and whose line of pull can cause the desired accessory motion. During muscle energy, the clinician stabilizes segments on which the distal aspect of the muscle attaches. The command for an isometric contraction of the muscle is given, which causes an accessory movement of the joint. 
A thrust is a high velocity, short amplitude motion that a patient cannot prevent. A thrust is a type of manipulation. A thrust is performed at the end of the pathological limit of the joint to fix snap adhesions and or stimulate joint receptors. Manipulations are beyond the scope of practice of many athletic trainers, physical therapists, and occupational therapists unless additional training has been received. The two primary principles of joint mobilization that you must understand are concave and convex. Each joint pretty much has a convex area and a concave area. For example, the glenohumeral joint of the shoulder. In this example, the humeral head is the convex structure and the glenoid fossa of the scapula is a concave structure. In this type of joint, this is an example of a convex structure that moves on a stable concave structure. Another example would be the proximal interphalangeal joint of the finger. In this example, the middle phalange is the concave structure and the proximal phalange is the convex structure. This is an example of a concave structure that moves on a stable convex structure. We have just started talking about joint mobilizations, but it is clear early on that the mobilization should be performed when there is a joint, ligamentous tightness, or hypermobile joints. So this begs the question, would you perform joint mobilizations on someone who has hypermobile joints? These pictures are to demonstrate the many different types of hypermobile joints. In the event that someone has a hypermobile joint, what should we do? With accessory movements, we have joints that are either hypomobile, normal, or hypermobile. In the case of a hypomobile joint, the motion stops at some point referred to as a pathological limit, but this is short of the anatomical limit. The decrease in range of motion could be due to pain, spasm, or tissue resistance. In the event of a hypomobile joint, we need to implement joint mobilizations. Normal joints have full range of motion without pain and therefore should be left alone. Hypermobile joints move beyond its anatomical limit because of laxity in the surrounding structures. In the case of a hypermobile joint, the clinician should implement strengthening, stability, taping, splinting, and or bracing to help stabilize the joint. There are five types of movement that will be explored further. A roll, slide, spin, compression, and distraction. Three of these components are active during joint mobilization, usually the roll, spin, and slide. Joint motion often involves a combination of rolling, sliding, and spinning. During rolling, a series of points on one articulating surface come into contact with a series of points on another surface. An example of rolling would be a rocking chair analogy. When the chair rocks forward and backwards, there are different parts of the rocker that come into contact with a series of points on the floor. An additional example would be a ball rolling on the ground. In the human body, an example would be the femoral condyles rolling on the tibial plateau. In the human body, the roll occurs in the direction of the movement. Rolling can occur on incongruent or unequal surfaces. In the body, rolling usually occurs in combination with sliding or spinning. Here is an illustration of rolling. A spin occurs when one bone rotates around a stationary longitudinal mechanical axis. The same point on the moving surface creates an arc of a circle as the bone spins. In the human body, an example of this occurs at the radial head within the humeral radial joint during pronation and supination. It also occurs at the shoulder during flexion and extension and at the hip during flexion and extension activities. Spinning does not occur by itself during normal joint motion. Here is an illustration of spin. A glide or a slide occurs when specific points on one surface come into contact with a series of points on another surface. 
This typically occurs when the surfaces are congruent. When a passive mobilization technique is applied to produce a slide in the joint, it is referred to as a glide. It is common to combine rolling and sliding in a joint. The more congruent the surfaces are, the more sliding there is. The more incongruent the joint surfaces are, the more rolling there is. Here is an illustration of glide or slide. It is one thing to understand these three concepts, but it is another thing to understand what these three concepts mean in relationship to human anatomy. The following images will try to put these concepts into perspective. If we take the knee joint, the tibiofemoral joint, we can see the images of glide, roll, and spin. If no rolling or gliding occurred at the knee, eventually the condyles of the femur would fall off the tibial plateau during knee extension and flexion. This would be really bad during walking. There are two other motions that are available other than rolling, spinning, and gliding. These two motions are compression and distraction. A compression occurs when there is a decrease in space between the two joint surfaces which can add stability to the joint. This is a normal reaction of the joint to a muscle contraction. Distraction occurs when two joint surfaces are pulled apart. This is used in combination with joint mobilizations to increase the stretch of a capsule. The following images are an example of hip distraction. In order to understand and apply the theory of joint mobilization, students must be able to understand the basic rules needed to apply the mobilization. The basic application of correct mobilization techniques is dependent upon the relationship of the two articulating surfaces and the associated sliding and gliding. Typically, there is one joint surface that is mobile and one that is stable. The first rule is the concave convex rule. In the concave convex rule, the concave joint surfaces slide in the same direction as the bone movement with the convex joint surface that is stable. In other words, if the concave surface of the joint is moving on a stationary convex surface, then the glide occurs in the same direction as the roll. Due to this rule, the mobilization should be performed in the same direction as the desired movement. An example would be when the tibia swings posteriorly in knee flexion. The tibial joint surface glides posteriorly as well. If we look at the knee joint, we can see a stable femur that is convex. The tibia is concave and is moving during the knee flexion movement. Therefore, if the concave surface of the joint is moving on a stationary convex surface, then the glide will occur in the same direction as the roll and the concave convex rule applies. Here is an example of this rule in action in the knee joint. Another example would be flexion of the distal phalange of the finger joint. If we look at the finger joint, we can see a stable proximal phalange that is convex. The distal phalange is concave and is moving during finger flexion. Therefore, the concave surface of the joint is moving on a stationary convex surface, then the glide occurs in the same direction as the roll, and the concave convex rule applies as well. The second rule is the convex concave rule. In the convex concave rule, the convex joint surface slides in the opposite direction as the bone movement with the concave joint surface that is stable. In other words, if the convex surface of the joint is moving on a stationary concave surface, then the glide will occur in the opposite direction of the roll. Due to this rule, the mobilization should be performed in the opposite direction as the desired movement. An anatomical example of this rule is when the humerus, which is convex, swings up into abduction the head of the humerus must glide inferiorly to perform this motion. 
The next pictures are examples of the humerus gliding downward as the shoulder is abducted. If the shoulder did not glide downward, the humerus would run into the acromion process. The next pictures are examples of a shoulder that rolls but does not glide. Another example would be plantar flexion of the ankle. If we look at the ankle joint, we can see a stable tibia that is concave. The talus is convex and is moving during the plantar flexion movement of the foot. Therefore, if the concave surface of the joint is moving on a stationary convex surface, then the glide will occur in the opposite direction as the roll, and the convex concave rule applies as well. This is a visual example of the two rules being applied to the knee joint. A is an example of the convex surface, which is the femur, moving on a stable concave joint, which would be the tibia. This is an example of the convex concave rule, and therefore the mobilization would occur in the opposite direction as the movement. B is an example of the concave surface, which is the tibia, moving on a stable convex joint, which would be the femur. This is an example of the concave convex rule, and therefore the direction of the mobilization would occur in the same direction as the movement. A good rule of thumb is to look at the first word in the rule. When the convex concave rule applies, the convex surface is the one that is moving. That always helps me. I hope it helps you as well. There are multiple positive effects that are associated with the use of joint mobilizations. These effects include neurophysiological, nutritional, and mechanical effects. The neurophysiological effects result in stimulation of the mechanoreceptors to decrease pain. Joint mobilizations also affect muscle spasms and muscle guarding through the stimulation of the nociceptors. In addition, there is an increase in awareness of position and motion because of afferent nerve impulses. The nutritional effects are the result of distraction or small gliding movements which cause synovial fluid movement. The movement of synovial fluid can improve nutrient exchange due to the joint swelling and immobilization. The mechanical effects include improving the mobility of the hypomobile joint. These hypomobile joints are from adhesions and thickened connective tissue from immobilization. The goal of joint mobilization is to loosen these tissues. Joint mobilizations can also maintain extensibility and tensile strength of articular tissues. Occasionally, when performing joint mobilizations, cracking noises may sometimes occur. This does not mean that a manipulation has necessarily occurred. However, this cracking could occur as the result of placing the body in the optimal position for stretching and alignment to occur, and a manipulation may happen on accident. Joint mobilizations need to be performed with caution. They should not be used haphazardly. The contraindications for joint mobilization include inflammatory arthritis, malignancy, tuberculosis, osteoporosis, ligamentous rupture, herniated discs with nerve compression, bone disease, neurological involvement, bone fracture, congenital bone deformities, vascular disorders, and joint effusion. With joint effusion, we may use a grade one or grade two mobilization to help relieve pain. We'll talk about grades in just a little bit here. The precautions associated with joint mobilizations include osteoarthritis, pregnancy, flu, total joint replacement, severe scoliosis, poor general health, and a patient's inability to relax. The grading scale that is used to determine the type of mobilization is referred to as the Maitland Joint Mobilization Scale. The grading is based on the amplitude of the movement and where within the available range of motion the force is applied. A grade one mobilization occurs when small amplitude rhythmic oscillating movements are performed at the beginning of the range of movement. Grade one mobilizations are performed to manage pain and spasm. 
A grade two mobilization occurs when large amplitude rhythmic oscillating movements are performed within the mid range of movement. Grade two mobilizations are performed to manage pain and spasm as well. Grade one and two mobilizations are often used before and after treatment with grade three or four mobilizations. As has been previously stated, grade one and grade two mobilizations are primarily used for pain management and spasm reduction. Pain must be treated prior to any stiffness. Any painful condition can be treated daily. The small amplitude oscillations stimulate the mechanoreceptors, which help to limit pain perception. A grade three mobilization occurs when large amplitude rhythmic oscillating movements are performed up to the point of limitation in the range of movement. A grade three mobilization is performed to increase motion within the joint and these mobilizations help to stretch the capsule and the connective tissue structures. A grade four mobilization occurs when small amplitude rhythmic oscillating movements are performed at the very end of the movement. Grade four mobilizations are performed to increase motion within the joint, and these mobilizations stretch the capsule and connective tissue structures. These mobilizations are used when resistance limits movement in the absence of pain. Grades three and four mobilizations are primarily used to increase motion. Stiff or hypomobile joints should be treated three to four times a week, and treatment should alternate with active motion exercises. A grade five mobilization is also known as a thrust technique and is considered a manipulation. A grade five mobilization occurs when there is a small amplitude quick thrust at the end of the movement. This mobilization is accompanied by a popping sound, which indicates that it is a manipulation. There's a lot of force and velocity that occur with the manipulation. Grade five mobilizations require training to perform and may be on a clinician's scope of practice unless properly trained. This is a graphical representation of the five grades of joint mobilization. Remember, grade one and two are for pain and spasm. Grade three and four are to increase motion and decrease adhesions. Grades one through four mobilizations occur between the beginning point in the range of motion and the point of limitation. The point of limitation could occur from muscle spasm, pain, or overall tightness. A grade five mobilization pushes the joint beyond the point of limitation and up to the anatomical limit. If we surpass the anatomical limit, there is a good chance that we will dislocate the joint. When applying joint mobilizations, here are some general rules of thumb. All joint mobilizations follow the convex concave or the concave convex rules. Patients should be relaxed during the treatments. Explain the purpose of the treatment and the sensations that a patient should expect prior to the treatment. Evaluate before and after the treatment as well. Stop the treatment if it becomes too painful for the patient. As the clinician, use proper body mechanics so you don't hurt yourself during the treatment. Use gravity to assist the mobilization technique if possible. Begin and end treatments with grade one or two oscillations. The patient in the extremity should be in a position that it can relax during the treatment. If the patient cannot relax, then the treatment is going to be ineffective. Initial mobilization should be performed in a loose pack position. For some patients, the position to use is the one in which the joint is the least painful. As a clinician, you will need to firmly and comfortably stabilize one joint segment, usually the proximal bone. You can use a hand, a belt, or even an assistant to stabilize one of the joint surfaces. This prevents unwanted stress and makes the stretch force more specific and effective during the treatment. The treatment force is applied as close to the opposing joint surface as possible. The larger the contact surface is, the more comfortable the procedure will be. Try to use the flat surface of the hand instead of individual fingers for patient comfort. The direction of the movement during the treatment is either parallel or perpendicular to the treatment plane. In this case, the treatment plane lies on the concave articulating surface, perpendicular to a line from the center of the convex articulating surface. Joint glides and mobilizations will occur as a glide and will occur parallel to the joint surface. 
Joint traction techniques are applied perpendicular to the treatment plane. Gliding techniques are applied parallel to the treatment plane. You will need to glide in the direction that the slide would normally occur for the desired motion. The direction of sliding is easily determined by using the convex concave or the concave convex rule. The entire bone is moved so that there is gliding of one joint surface on another. If gliding in the restricted direction is too painful, begin gliding mobilizations in the painless direction and then progress to gliding in restricted directions when not as painful. During traction, the entire bone is moved so that the joint surfaces are separated. Traction is covered in another lecture. Joint mobilization sessions usually involve three to six sets of oscillations. Perform two to three oscillations per second, lasting approximately 20 to 60 seconds for tightness. If your goal is to treat pain, your treatment should last one to two minutes with two to three oscillations per second. You want to make sure that you apply smooth, regular oscillations. You can vary the speed of oscillations for different effects. For painful joints, apply intermittent distraction for seven to 10 seconds with a few seconds of rest in between for several cycles. For restricted joints, apply a minimum of six second stretch force, followed by a partial release, and then repeat with slow intermittent stretches at three to four second intervals. Reevaluate the joint response the next day or have the patient report at the next visit. If the patient has an increase in pain, reduce the amplitude of the oscillations. If the joint is the same or better, perform either of the following. You can repeat the same maneuver if the goal is to maintain joint play, or you could progress to sustain grade three traction or glides if the goal is to increase joint play. Please realize that the patient may complain of soreness following joint mobilizations. You should only perform joint mobilizations on alternate days to allow soreness to decrease and tissue healing to occur. After joint mobilizations, patients should perform active range of motion techniques. The patient's joint and range of motion should be reassessed after treatment and again before the next treatment, and pain is always our guide. Please make sure to complete quiz number 15 over joint mobilizations. The quiz is worth 10 points and you will have 10 minutes to complete the quiz.